If you live off of another organism and you harm that organism in the process, you are a parasite. Up here on land, we can be infected with a gruesome host of parasites, from microscopic protozoans to lice and fleas, all the way up to three meter long tapeworms. Down in the deep, life is so weird already, and parasites take it to a whole new depth. I'm here at the Molyneux Benthic Ecology Lab at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution to meet some experts in deep sea parasites. So um, my research focuses on parasites at deep sea hydrothermal vents, which are these hot springs on the seafloor right. where life is just flourishing around them. And it turns out we find a lot of the same types of parasites in the deep sea that we find in a lot of other marine ecosystems. So obviously the pressure and the depth and the lack of sunlight is no barrier to parasites persisting and thriving in these ecosystems. Parasites are not all bad. In fact, they're pretty incredible ecosystem engineers, helping to keep populations from getting out of control, which can allow other rarer species to survive. There's this crazy parasite called a rhizocephalin, which is actually a type of barnacle, but it actually attacks and invades crabs and other crustaceans, and it castrates them and it grows a rootlet system through the host's body. It still looks like a crab, but it's basically just producing parasite offspring. So it is sort of the uh, parasite's own personal factory. These truly are the things of horror movies. Sometimes the parasite can change the host's behavior in order to make it more likely to reach its next host. These are just wild ways to live. Yeah. And the fact that this evolved and then is persisting and working, especially in an environment as harsh as the deep sea, I think is really interesting. Yeah. And it helps us get at what are the limits to life persisting and surviving under harsh conditions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Roundworms, or nematodes, were found almost two miles deep in a gold mine in South Africa, somehow surviving on bacterial biofilms near to drilling holes. Finding life this deep opens up the door to what life might exist on other planets, especially those which might previously have had conditions for life but now seem uninhabitable. So one of my favorite parasite types is called the trematode. These are those parasitic flatworms. And what interests me about them is they don't only use one host species, they have to pass through three different host species to complete their life cycle. I thought in ecosystems like vent in particular, where the habitat is really patchy and it's also really disturbed by volcanic eruptions, I thought a parasite that needs three hosts to be there, especially in a disturbed system, might find it hard to live there. Right. And that's actually not what we found. There are a lot of trematode species at vents and there seems like they're completing their life cycle entirely in vent hosts. So trematodes start as an adult in the gut of a fish and then their eggs are passed out of the fish and hatch into this swimming larva called a myricidium. Mm -hmm. And this is microscopic. It swims through the water and it finds the next host, which is a snail. And inside that host, it makes these asexually cloning sacs. And it actually castrates the snail, just like that rhizocephalin that we were talking about right. earlier. Then these asexually cloned larvae basically leave the snail as these free swimming forms called cercaria, and they penetrate the next host and form this cyst called a metacercaria. Right. Inside any number of species, it can be a small crustacean or a worm or even a small fish. And that cyst just lies in wait in that host, and it's waiting for that host to get eaten by the predator, which is this big fish. These parasites rely on so many other species to persist. Right. They can be indicators of an ecosystem that is diverse and has healthy functioning interactions between species. I guess, yeah, it's, it's probably a really good thing that this view around parasites is starting to change a bit because as wacky and weird as they are, as uncomfortable as they make us, they are obviously very important for the ecosystems uh, that they live in. So in order for the ecosystem to thrive and be healthy, I guess parasites have to thrive and be healthy as well. Yeah. So I think it's probably fair to say that deep sea parasite research is a pretty niche field, but I know that over in Corpus Christi, Texas, a friend of yours, Dr. Chuck Blend, he's waiting on the line for us, right? Yeah, my friend Chuck is actually about to do some live investigations for parasites right now, so why don't we go watch? Absolutely, let's do it. So I see you've got some super interesting equipment here, and I'm very, very excited about it. So what is it exactly that you're gonna be showing us today? Well, today we get the opportunity, everyone, to join me in a real live deep sea fish examination for parasites. Take it away, let's do it. All right, well, uh, I have brought here a container of deep sea fish, specifically these are called tripod fish. They're on the abyssal plains and continental slopes of oceans throughout the world. And they have modified fins to be able to stand up off the bottom 
just a few centimeters. And because these fish are so hard to obtain, the chances are very good that what we find today will be new to science. I've not examined tripod fish before, so this is first time for me too. I'm really excited to, to see if this particular individual uh, has any parasites in or on him. I'm going to lift up the gill flaps and check the gills. So, uh, this fish is too healthy. <laughs> Nothing so far. All right, so it, it, the external examination is complete, but the good stuff is yet to come as we go inside now. So I'm gonna make an incision, get just above the stomach, because the worms I'm looking for are in the GI tract there, gastrointestinal tract. Now I'm gonna go through the internal organs, and I'm gonna separate them out. The gonads, the liver, and I'll set that aside. I want to go through now and look at the intestinal tract. We always go through each organ individually because some parasites specialize on different organs, so it gives us really good data on oh, yeah. what habitat the parasite needs inside the host. Ooh, okay, now there's something that pops out. I don't know if you can see it. This looks like possibly a round worm and I will set this nematode aside and look at it closer after the examination. Oh, well, what do we have here? This looks promising. Could be new to science. Ah! I have found acanthocephalus, those spiny-headed worms I was telling you about. There are several in here. They have a head on them called a proboscis. Imagine a baseball bat with lots of nasty looking spikes and hooks on them. Basically implant themselves, anchor themselves in the wall, the intestinal wall of a host. And acanthocephalins use arthropods as intermediate hosts. On land, that's insects, and in water and aquatic environments, that's crustaceans. I hope you can see this. There I they are. I see them. Yes. And that's the acanthocephalins, and you can see one of them, at least one, has the little proboscis sticking out, that spike-covered baseball bat. I was looking for these. This is wonderful, wonderful. I can see it right there. This is a type of fluke, and I've nicknamed it gunslinger, because if you look at it, it has two organs called vitellaria. They produce yolk for the egg, and it looks like a gunslinger. This is gonna be something new, folks. Now, when you find one, there's typically gonna be some more. We got another one. I have what looks to be at least one other fluke. The fact that we have more than one individual worm allows us to measure that variability, which is important. It tells us a lot of information. I'm gonna remove it and put it with his friend in here. And sure enough, that's a third fluke. Now we have three from this fish. All right, one last look. And then I will finish up just scanning the ovaries and other connective tissue, liver, things like this. Oh, that's pretty good all. Three digenetic trematodes, three acanthocephalins, and a nematode. Once at sea, I was dissecting a vent fish, which are much bigger than the fish that Chuck is dissecting, so it's a lot to process. Oh, yeah. And I found 500 trematodes in its stomach, and I pulled out every one individually. I was up all night. I was gonna say, I can't even imagine how long mm -hmm. that would take. That completes the examination of this wonderful fish who produced for us six, seven parasitic worms. And chances are, nine times out of 10, this is something new to science. And so, congratulations, everybody. Yeah, woo, amazing. Even though I am still a little bit grossed out by parasites, I have definitely a newfound respect for them. And this is, this is so amazing. So thank you both so much. So there you have it. This is kind of the perfect example of how little we actually know about our oceans. The more we look, the more likely we are to find something that is completely new to science. 